I am so glad to be back in church. A uh, couple, little over two weeks ago, I squatted down to do something, and when I did a free stand back up, I tore my meniscus in my right knee. My leg locked up. I had a bucket tear. I could not extend my knee. Um, went through the weekend and, and uh, went to the doctor, and thank God, through some connections in this church, got to an ortho on Thursday. He did surgery on me last Thursday. And so I'm about 10 days out of my surgery and everything went well. And, and uh, I'm just glad to be, to be back here in the pulpit with you guys back at High Praises. So they've got me a chair and I've, I've sit in a little bit. You know me, you can't keep me down much, but I'm going to try. But I want to I wanna preach today. I couldn't wait to get here today because there's some things I want to share with you. I'm just so excited. So John chapter 13, beginning of verse 3. If you grew up in church, you know anything about the Bible, you may be familiar with this. If you aren't and you didn't grow up in church, we're about to familiarize you, you with this. So here's how it reads. John 13, 3. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but you will after this. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. And I want you to notice how Jesus responds. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. In other words, if that's the case, give me a bath. And Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you all are clean. He's talking out all the disciples, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you are not all clean. And obviously, that's Judas Iscariot. Thank you for reverence the word. You can be seated. Okay. So, let me ask you a question. I'd like to see raised hands, please. How many of you in this house can say, Pastor Chris, I have participated in, in my life at some point, a feet washing service? Let me see your hand. Hold it up real high. Okay. Everybody just look around because I want you to see how few hands there are. Okay, put your hands down. How many of you have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about? Okay, all right, so we got hands up. How many of you, you're not going to raise your hand if I gave you a million dollars? Raise your hand. Never fails. Okay, you don't get a gold star because you didn't participate. Um, when I was growing up in church, my dad was a pastor. We would have feet washing services, and they would go something like this. It was usually a Sunday night or a Wednesday night. It was night. I always remember it was night. Women in the church would have these pitchers and bowls, or, or they're sometimes called ewers, ewers, ewers. I never have been able to say that right. But how many have ever seen like a pitcher and a bowl? You see them in cowboy movies because they don't have running water, okay? So a lot of them are antiques. Well, these women in the church would have these, and they would bring them to church, Okay. And you would fill the pitcher up with water, and you would pour the water into a bowl. The women would separate and go to another room. The men would be in another room. And what we would do is you would partner up with somebody, and then you would get the bowl, pour water into it, and then either the person would take their shoes and socks off, or you would take them off, and then you would literally wash that person's feet. You would take water and cup it out of the, out of the basin and over their feet. Some people would even wash their feet, just rub it, and you would wash their feet, then dry it with a towel. And then you would trade places, and that other person would do that to you. And what was happening is that people, people we don't do this anymore, but we did it then because, you know, we're, we were trying to do what Jesus said to do. And, and I, there's a whole other sermon that I could preach on why we should or we shouldn't do it. I don't think it's something necessary we shouldn't do. I don't think it's something we have to do. It's an ordinance like water baptism or um, communion. But... I have been in several feet washing services, and I will tell you this morning that in my life, in my life's experiences, 
Those moments have been some of the richest spiritual experiences I have ever had in my life with Jesus. Unbelievable brokenness and humility. I've wept. I cried to feel the presence and the power of God. It was unbelievable. And I know right now you may be saying, whew, I don't know if I want to do that. I know. It takes, and it's kind of my message today, it takes getting past some things to be willing to have your feet washed or to wash somebody's feet. And yet, it can be so powerful. I, I have some memories. I did a, when I was a youth pastor for 10 and a half years at a church called Praise Cathedral, the church that this church started out of 22 years ago now. Um, when I was a youth pastor there, I started something called Praise Fest. It was a weekend youth retreat in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. I did it for seven years. The last year we did it, the last two years, we had 2,000 teenagers from all over the south and northeast driving in, coming into Myrtle Beach at the convention center, and it was just a massive event, Friday, Saturday, Sunday event. That event initially was birthed out of me taking my youth group eight years earlier, seven, eight years earlier, to Myrtle Beach. We went to the Holiday Inn Express Oceanfront, and we had a service plan for Sunday morning. My brother-in-law, Joel, came down. He's going to preach and then we just did activities Friday night, <clears throat> all day Saturday. And we had rented a ballroom in the Holiday Inn Express. And so we did fun activities. And Joel set up his, his keyboard and we would sing funny songs and do stuff with the teenagers. And that, that Friday night, we finished. And we were done. And I said, Joel, what are we going to do now? And Joel said, well, I could play my saxophone. So we dimmed the lights and we had all the kids sit around the the perimeter of the room, so the, the main floor was just empty. And Joel started playing his sax. <clears throat> and if I remember, he started playing Holy Ground. And as he's playing, <clears throat> all of a sudden, the presence and the power of God filled that room. And I looked around, I said, okay, we didn't plan this. This was not on the agenda. What is happening? The Holy Ghost is moving in here. I mean, you could feel him. And all of a sudden, teenagers got up from sitting on the perimeter, started going into the center of the room and falling on their faces and crying and praying and seeking God. This started and went on for hours into the wee hours of the morning. God just moved. I saw kids that were the whole gothic scene with the black fingernails and black everything that had come on the trip probably because their parents made them, broken and weeping and crying and asking Jesus to save them. One of them went into missions. <laughs> I mean, it was a move of God that was unbelievable. And, and the, the, one of the events from that night that sticks in my mind is that in the course of us flowing and God just moving for hours into the wee hours of the morning, at some point, something happened. Um, one of my staff members, Tommy Harvey, who's now the executive pastor at Praise Cathedral, went back in a side room and found a big metal bowl and took a gooseneck hose or, 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 or sprayer and filled that bowl with water and grabbed a a motel towel and came back in there and walked up to me and said, Chris, can I wash your feet? What was I going to tell him? No. So I said, absolutely. I sat out in a chair and he, he took my socks and shoes off and he washed my feet. And so when he finished, I said, Tommy, can I, can I do this for you? Can I wash your feet? And I, I washed his feet. And we just kept making trips back and forth to that side room, dumping out the water and refilling it. And after we had done that, my staff, which consisted not only of youth workers, but parent, parents who were chaperones, grabbed that bowl and started washing one another's feet. We were having a spontaneous feet washing service. And, and so adults are washing one another's feet. And then I saw something I thought I would never see. I never saw it again, is that teenagers grabbed that bowl and went back in that room and filled it up and started washing one another's feet. And there was a spontaneous feet washing service with teenagers. I couldn't believe it. As they would cry and weep and they would wash one another's feet and serve one another and, and care and bless for one another. It was unbelievable. And probably the moment that stands out the most for me that night was that in the flow of the Spirit, I, I said, I had the mic, I said, let me say something while y'all are just praying. I said, God just told me right now that one of you is, are, are wanting to be baptized with the Holy Ghost and you haven't been filled. And God just told me that if you will get one of your friends and you will wash their feet, that God told me he, to tell you he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. 
And when I said that, there was a girl in my youth group named Adrian, beautiful redheaded girl, and she had been seeking to be filled with the Holy Ghost, and she didn't give anybody else a chance. She grabbed that bowl, grabbed her friend, and went over, sat her in that chair, and with hot tears pouring down her face, she washed her friend's feet in obedience and hope and faith for what God would do. And I'm going to tell you right now, it didn't take 60 seconds into washing that girl's feet that the power and the presence of the Holy Ghost got all over her and she started speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. And I'm not talking about sha na na and I'm through. I'm talking about she just, it flowed like a river, y'all. She was speaking in that heavenly language. It was flowing out of her and God baptized her with the Holy Ghost just because she washed somebody's feet. There's something powerful and meaningful to me about that kind of experience. When Jesus did it 2,000 years ago in this recorded event in the Bible, he did it because it was a common practice. Basically, in the first century, people walked on dusty roads. They had sandals or, or bare feet so that your, your feet would get dirty. When you entered a house the protocol was that a servant would perform the menial task of washing the dirt off your feet while you were in the house. On the night before Jesus' death, Jesus met with his disciples to celebrate the Passover and, and to institute the Lord's Supper. It is the eve of his crucifixion. Okay, he's, he's going to be dead 24 hours from now. Let's, yeah, 24 hours now, essentially, he's going to be dead. And so in that night, it's interesting that there was no servant to wash any of the feet. None of the disciples volunteered to wash Jesus' feet or anybody else's feet. They're all there with dirty feet. And so Jesus, seeing what's happening, decides to use this moment to teach some powerful experiences. And so he takes a towel and he gets a bowl of water and he goes down the line, all 12 of the disciples, and he washes their feet washes their feet, and there are two lessons that he wanted to teach them. The first lesson was servitude or servanthood because what he did was scandalous. You, you did not, you, you, if you were the teacher or the master or the person that was higher up in society, you didn't do what Jesus did. Somebody lower down on the, on the rung would step up to do that. But here's Jesus, who is the rabbi, the teacher, goes with his students, his followers, and he washes each and every one of their feet. He humbled himself to teach them selfless service and humility. But there was a second purpose for his actions, and it's what I want to focus on today. I think that he used feet washing as a way to foreshadow his death for the salvation of mankind. And the reason I say that is because there are some correlations that, that show me this, if you read verse 4 and then verse 12, we read it, okay? It says that Jesus laid aside his garments, then he washed their feet, and then it said he took them back up again. If you go to John 10, John 10, 17, Jesus said, Therefore my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. You see the correlation. Jesus was saying, I'm going to lay down my clothes and I'm going to serve you and do what you can't do and won't do for yourself, and then I'm going to take my clothes back up. And on Calvary, y'all, Jesus laid down his life to do the greatest thing we ever could have done for us, not to wash dirt off our feet, but to wash our sins away. And three days later, he took his life back up again, and he lives today to save us from our sins. So feet washing is representative of the cleansing and the forgiveness that can come through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now back to the story. He's washing John's feet, James's feet, uh, Bartholomew's feet, Andrew's feet, Thomas's feet, even Judas Iscariot's feet, who's going to betray him. And then he gets to Peter. And Peter cannot fathom why Jesus is washing his feet. I mean, Jesus was God, Peter was a man. Jesus was the teacher, Peter was the student. Jesus was the rabbi, Peter was his follower. Jesus was the Holy One of Israel. Peter was carnal and sometimes sinful. Peter felt unworthy for him to do this for him. He, he felt like he did not deserve to have his feet cleaned by one who was so perfect and so pure. 
And I know that there may very well be this morning in this service or some of you watching online right now, someone in this place who feels exactly like Peter felt. That when it comes to your life and the sin in your life and then holy Jesus, you think I am totally undeserving for anything that God would do for me. I have been, I have been bad. I have been horrible. I want to be right with God. I'd love to be right with God, but I don't feel deserving because I have been bad too many times in too many ways for too long. Well, regardless of how Peter was feeling, Jesus was determined to wash his feet. And there's some things I noticed in this story. Jesus knew how much dirt was on Peter's feet. He knew how much dirt was, but that didn't matter to him. He washed them anyway. And, and he did it for all the other disciples. And, and basically, if he was going to do it for them, he was determined he was going to do it for, for Peter too. I mean, if he could wash <clears throat> Judas Iscariot's feet, who, who's going to about to betray him and ultimately send him to the cross, hey, I can wash your feet, Peter. And here's the good news. No matter how bad you are, no matter how bad you've been, Jesus is determined to save you from your sins. He is determined. It is his mission. It is his goal. It is his objective. It is his heart's desire. He even said himself, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And can I tell you this morning, God knows the dirt on you. He does. Not, not, not the physical dirt, but he knows the sin on your life. He, he knows every sin you have committed. Every dirty thought that has run through your mind. He knows how mean you are. He knows every vile word that has come out of your mouth. He knows how unfair you are, how unkind you are, how selfish you are, how unloving you are, how vulgar you are, how crude you are, how belligerent you are, how low down you are, how unfaithful you are. He knows. He knows what you did this weekend. That's right. You may be sitting in church today, but he knows where you were and what you said and what you did this weekend. He knows how you've played the religious hypocrite. You're not fooling him. He knows how you act one way at church, but you act an entirely different way when you're at school or at work. Oh, yeah, he knows it. Jeremiah 17, 10, God said, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. God knows the dirt on you, but I got good news. He has saved countless others for 2,000 years. He has saved all kinds of people with all kinds of sin. And regardless of how deep in sin you may be this morning, I'm here to tell you if he has saved others, he will save you. Regardless of all of that, he will save you. Because here's my little wordplay. When it comes to God saving a sinner, there is no exception. There is only reception. You say, well, will God look at me and say, yeah, I can save everybody except him, except her, because you've been way too bad. Nope, you can never be way too bad. There are no exceptions. It doesn't matter how long you've done it, how bad you've been, what you've done. I messed everybody up one Sunday. I preached how God will forgive a pedophile. God will forgive a serial killer. God will forgive a child murderer. God will, God will forgive. You just go down the worst of the, God would forgive Hitler. Yeah, believe it or not, God would forgive Saddam Hussein. God would forgive Osama bin Laden. You say, really? Yes, the grace and the love of God goes, it doesn't matter how bad you've been, God will save you if you come to him with faith and grace. He'll receive you. There's no exception, only reception. He will say, you know the old hymn, Just As I Am, Without One Plea? The songwriter had it right. You don't come to God plea bargaining. You don't come to God negotiating. You don't come to God making excuses. You just come with all of your sin, all your guilt, all your shame, and you lay it down at his feet. And you say, here it is. I need you. I need you to save me. So Peter has the Lord standing there with a towel and a bowl of water ready to wash his feet. 
And Peter looks at him and says, Lord, you will never wash my feet. Can I just tell y'all today, the worst thing you can ever do to say to ever do is say to God, never. How many of you have been serving the Lord long enough to raise your hand and say, Pastor, you are right? Come on, somebody give me an amen. Never say, he said, why, Pastor Chris? Because if you say never to God, God will say, oh, really? We'll see about that. My sister said, I will never marry a preacher, and she didn't. God called Scott to the ministry after they got married. Couldn't get out of that one, sis. Do you know the guy that came here by the leading of the Lord 22 years ago to plant a church, spent two and a half years with his congregation in T.L. Hannah High School? This guy right here said out loud more than once, I will never plant a church. God said, oh, really? We'll see about that. Wait till 1999 January comes around, big boy. Your life's about to change. Never say never. Peter said, Lord, you will never wash my feet. And I went back and looked at that in the original language. I love it. This is, this is kind of the, really the literal sense of what he said. This is strong. This is strong, y'all. Never at any time will you wash my feet forever. That's what it means in the Greek language. That's what Peter was saying to the Lord. Now listen to me. We're laughing. But here's the truth. You can tell the Lord no if you want to. If Jesus is working on you and saying to you, I want to save you, and the Holy Spirit's drawing you, you can tell him no. You can reject Jesus' offer to save you from all your sins and make you right with God. People do it all the time. And they do it for all kinds of reasons. I don't know why Peter didn't pride, embarrassment. You know, Peter got embarrassed one time because the Lord said that he was going to die, and Peter took him aside and tried to straighten him out. By the way, you don't ever straighten out Jesus. He straightens out you out. And, and so I think he, he got embarrassed. Or whatever. And people, people won't, they tell the Lord no because they have pride. I'm too proud to go to an altar. I'm too proud to yield to Christ. They're embarrassed what people are going to think. Selfish. People love to sin. They love their sin. They love their sin more than they want Jesus. They don't care that it's killing them, destroying their marriage, destroying their family, destroying their health, ruining their life. They just love to sin. They love the world. By the way, the world doesn't love you back. The world will chew you up, spit you out, and use you. And that's the same thing sin does. It destroys you. So you can tell him no, but let me just say to you today, you have a problem. You can never come up with a good enough reason not to be saved. You can't. You can try, but you will never come up with a good enough reason. So Peter said, nope, never, ain't gonna happen, Uh uh-uh. And this has brought me to the message I want to share today. This is what I want to talk about. Jesus looked at him and responded, Peter, if I do not wash you, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. And really, he didn't say your feet. He just said, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. There is a powerful spiritual truth there. And I spent a considerable amount of time in preparation for this message today so that I could try to get my hands around that greasy pig running around. What does it mean to have part with him? What does that, and so here's what my study has come up with. In essence, Jesus was saying, if I don't wash you, you have no relationship with me. You have no fellowship with me. You have no communion with me. There is no spiritual connection between us. Between us, If I don't wash you, you have no divine destiny. There is no future for you, no place in my family for you. There is no place in the kingdom of God for you. Peter, if I don't wash you, this is very interesting, there is no heritage or inheritance for you. And I went back and I looked, and the, and the comparable Greek, uh, the, the word in Hebrew is kelek, and the word kelek, which is, the, what, which is what we, if we were to try to find this word in the Old Testament, it's, it represented the, the inheritance for the children of Israel, which would have been like the promised land and all the free stuff and having being a nation and, and having a destiny and a future and inheritance and all that God wanted to give them, a land flowing with milk and honey. That's what it's talking about. All that you have for you, heaven, eternal life, immortality, incorruptibility, a place in the Father's house, uh, a place ruling and reigning in the kingdom of God as a priest and a king when Jesus comes back. How many are looking for the day when Jesus comes back and rules this world instead of corrupt politicians? All that's your inheritance. Peter, God, Jesus said to Peter, 
none of that is yours if I don't wash you. Are you getting it? I think it's interesting that some people want the benefits of salvation without getting saved. They like to attend church. I've seen this. They like to be around saved folks. They like to hear our music, enjoy the preaching. They want to feel the goosebumps when the atmosphere is anointed. They like to watch the Holy Spirit move on other people. I've seen it. I, I, I saw one man, and I love this man, but he sat in the orchestra for years and years and years and years and years. He had a moral failing. Now, I'm involved, tried to help him with his marriage, his children. I'm talking with him. I'm dealing with him. And in the course of our conversation, I said, have you ever been saved? And he looked me in the eye and said, no. And I said, so would you please satisfy a curiosity for me? How in this world did you sit on this stage with anointed services year after year after year after year and the power of God moving and the Holy Spirit convicting and you hearing the gospel time and time and time again and you would not give your life to Jesus? He didn't have an explanation for me. He just said, I wouldn't. I didn't. It happens. But you hear this pastor today, this preacher. You can attend High Praises Church every Sunday. You can give your tithe. You can attend Growth Track. You can be in a life group. You can sing our songs. You can say amen when I'm preaching. You can come down and stand in the altar with everybody else when I give these general altar calls. But none of that matters at all until Jesus washes your sins away and you take your place in him. Are you hearing me today? Because it is one thing to be part of a church. It is another thing to be part of Jesus. They can be one and the same, but they can be two different things. See, it's what is called being in Christ. Ever heard that? In Christ. What does that mean? It means your life is lost in his life. It means that, that when people look at you, something about you reminds them of Jesus. Jesus. The Bible says if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Everything has become new. Whatever you were prior to salvation, you are no longer. You are somebody new, somebody different. You are, you are in Jesus, and Jesus is in you. Your identity is in Christ. When people look at you, everything you think and say and do reminds them of Jesus. See, salvation is not reformation. Salvation is not a restructuring of your life's priorities. I've had people you know, start coming to church saying, well, you know, I need to get right with the Lord. I'm going to start coming to church. Coming to church doesn't make you right with the Lord. I'm going to start reading my Bible. Reading your Bible doesn't make you right with the Lord. Getting right with the Lord makes you right with the Lord. Then you'll read your Bible and you'll come to church and you'll pray because there's been a change in your life. It's not reformation, it's transformation. He comes in, he changes your life. You become a partaker of Jesus' divine nature and I don't understand that because I am human nature. And yet I know some people believe in a dichotomy, trichotomy. I believe in a trichotomy. I believe there are three parts to me. I am body, soul, and spirit. My body's the gateway to the world. My soul's the gateway to myself. But my spirit is the gateway to God. And I believe with all my heart that when, when God saved me, there was a spiritual union that took place. He who is one with the Lord, the Bible says, is one with him in spirit. So there is a spiritual connection between me and Jesus and I don't understand that I've become a partaker of divine nature. That blows me away. That's not, that's not just getting a little touch of religion. Come on, somebody. That's getting changed. That's getting something. That's something radical that makes me in a divine connection with God, and that is life transforming. You are not the same once that happens. When you get saved, you are somebody different because it's Jesus on the inside working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. So when he saved me, I became a member of his body. When he saved me, I became a member of his church. When he saved me, I became a member of his family. When he saved me, I became a living stone in this holy church. Jesus and I are united spiritually. Listen, I don't put him on and take him off like a set of clothes. 
So there are people that do that. They put Jesus on for Sunday morning after partying all weekend on Friday and Saturday night. No, you didn't put Jesus on. I don't know what you think you did, but you didn't put Jesus on. Because the Bible says, don't love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the things of the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Don't tell me you love Jesus because you don't. This is hard preaching. But I mean, you can either take it or die and go to hell. I'd rather you take it and hear some loving gospel preached to you today. I don't understand it all. He is in me and I am in him. A holy union that I can't understand, but here's what I know. I know him and he knows me. I feel him. He lives in my heart. I, this week in my own just personal devotions, I read John chapter 17. You ought to read the last part of John chapter 17 because it is written to an audience of the 21st century, us. Jesus prays for you. Did you know that? Jesus actually prayed for you. He said, Father, I pray for not only the disciples, but for those who will believe in me. And I pray that they may be one even as we are one. That I am in you and you are in me, that they may be one in us. He is talking about a holy union where I am connected with the Godhead and some kind of a holy spiritual union. That's awesome. That's not getting a little touch of religion. That's a radical life transformation. That we are one and I feel him and I know him and he strengthens me and he comforts me and he encourages me and he helps me and he works inside of me. That's what I'm talking about when you're part of Jesus. He's real to you. You, you ever met a fake Christian? Sure you have. How'd you know they were fake? Because what they said, thought, and did didn't sound like somebody that was changed by Jesus Christ. Okay? You ever met a real Christian? How'd you know they were real? because you could tell there was something different about them. They made you think of Jesus, the way they talked, the way they acted. They were, they were in stark contrast to everybody else who was in sin and the way they talked and acted. Y'all with me? It ain't a little dab of do you religion. It is a change of life. That's why change saved people live right. If you get saved but you don't live right, you're not saved. When you get saved, nobody has to walk around behind you saying, no, you need to start doing this. Don't do that anymore. Shame on you. Now, you know better than that. no. You got somebody to do that. It doesn't have to be me, your mama, your husband, your wife. It's called the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit inside of me is inside of me. He's already changed me. And if I'm starting to go in the wrong direction, there's a voice inside of me that says, eh, wrong direction. Go this way. And I say, yes, sir. That's why it's so important that Jesus washes you clean. He died on a cross and shed his blood to remove all of your sins. I want you to think about this. Jesus humbled himself to become a man. Jesus humbled himself to wash his disciples' feet. Jesus humbled himself to die an ignominious death on a cross. Did you know it is very possible that Jesus was naked? He was naked when he died on the cross. We always see him with a loincloth, but it is very, that was very, that's a historical fact that people who were crucified were normally naked. You talk about shame and humility. What the lengths, by the way, you know who the, the most humble person is in all of creation? God. God, the glorious, majestic God, humbled himself and became obedient to death, the Bible says, even to death on a cross. There is nobody more humble than the glorious God of all creation. Blow your mind, won't it? When you look at what he did, that was nothing but pure humility. And he did all those things. He humbled himself so that in return, he asked you to humble yourself and come to him so that he can wash your sins away. He did not consider it beneath his dignity to perform the greatest task for you, and that was to die on the cross and shed his blood so that your sins could be washed away. He surrendered himself to the cross so that you might come and surrender your life to him. So I want to do something this morning. I, I need some volunteers. So I'm going, to, I'm going to recruit some volunteers. So Tracy, you're a life group leader. Will you come help me? Come up on the stage, Okay. Joey, you want to help me out? So, Tracy, what I want you to do, there's a chair right over there by that entranceway. If you'll bring it over here, please. Oh. 
If you don't mind, Tracy, would you put it right there? Thank you. Just everybody can see. And I want you to sit there, Tracy. What, what am I going to do, Tracy? Stand up just a minute. Let's turn it where we make it work here. I think everybody can see over there. Just sit like, like that. Okay, Joey, I want you to come over here. I'm going to give you those. Okay. And I, I would do this myself. But with my bum knee, I got down. It might not, I may not get back up. Okay. So you're going to stand in for me today. I appreciate you doing that. And what I want to ask you to do for me is I want you to wash Tracy's feet with those wet wipes. Will you do it? Gladly. Okay. Go ahead. Tracy, thank you for doing this. Because, see, while he's doing this right now and taking off your shoes and your socks, right now you could look at me and say, Pastor, no, this has got to stop. I don't want this. He said, I felt like saying it. That's what you get for sitting on the front row, right, Yashika? <laughs> don't y'all you, don't you move on the back row now. But he could have said, this is embarrassing. He could say it right now. He could say, I'll never come back to this church. Pastor embarrassed me. My pride's hurt. I wish I'd have known he was going to do this. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have come up there. I told him, get somebody else. See, Y'all with me? But, and he still could get up. I mean, he can. He's bigger than I am, and I'm hurt. I can't chase him down. He can outrun me. I'm hobbling. But you notice he did. You notice that he overcame any pride and embarrassment. He thought about it, but what's he doing? He's sitting here, and he's letting Joey wash his feet. Now, Joe, before you get started, Tracy, I'm sorry. I, I don't know whether you got your feet washed today or not, but Joey's going to have to deal with Odor, toe lint, toe lint. Y'all get the toe lint where it gets on your big toe? Now, I knew you were going to laugh, but I'm saying this on purpose. I knew you would laugh. It's funny, okay? He didn't get a chance to prep. He could be saying, Pastor, I wish you to call me and let you know you're going to recruit me to volunteer. Don't y'all love my version of volunteering? I could at least make sure my, you know, spray a little cologne on there, something, bless my heart, just something, you know. But let me just tell you today, when you come to Jesus, you don't only have to lay aside your pride and your embarrassment, and you have to humble surrender yourself, but you don't get any prep. You don't get to say, Lord, I'm going to try to straighten up some things, clean up my life, try to get it, I'm going to try to help you, Lord, and then I'll get my life right. No, you just come with the toe lint, uncut toenails, I'm trying to think everything in the world, the odor. I'm going to say something embarrassing so you don't feel so bad. I don't know why, but I got that, on this foot, I got that stinking toe fungus you can get that makes your toenails up. I hate that. I've seen other people, they're like, oh, now, now I got it. I tried to take the medicine, I broke out in a rash. So I got to get a topical to try to kill it. I had surgery 10 days ago. They rolled, the, you know, they, you get nothing on but a gown. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I said, oh God, please let me leave my socks on my ugly feet. I always had pretty feet, y'all. One of them still is. They rolled me in there with all those professional doctors and nurses, wheeled me in those lights. And I'm thinking, oh, God, they got to see my feet. I could have said, I'm not having this surgery till I get this toe fungus dealt with. No. You know why I didn't worry about my toe fungus? Because my knee was locked up, and I was in pain, and I was in a mess, and I couldn't fix myself, and I wasn't going to get any better. It was only going to get worse. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost. I'm about to shout right there. I needed help from somebody that could help me, I, what I couldn't do for myself. I didn't care what my feet looked like. I didn't care about anything else. I just needed somebody to help me. Come on, somebody. You with me? When you come to Jesus, you don't care. You don't care. He knows. He knows. He knows everything, but he looks beyond your faults and he finds your need. And your need is you need to be saved. Wash his feet, Joey. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. See, Tracy just has to sit here. There's nothing you can do. You just have to receive the work 
that Joey did. And I'll tell you one thing, pal. I don't know the condition of your feet. I know you. I'm sure you took a bath and they're clean. But for the sake of my illustration, either way, it doesn't matter. They're clean now. Because this man got on his knees and washed your feet. And I'm here to tell you today, this is what Jesus, the Son of the living God, God Almighty, this is how much God loves you, is that just as Joey knelt and did the task of a servant, Jesus came 2,000 years ago as a servant, and he died and shed his blood. And today, he's, if you will, kneeling figuratively, if you will, saying, I'll wash not your feet, but I'll wash every one of your sins away. And when you leave here, you won't be the same. You'll be somebody different. Thank you so much. I'll let you get your shoes on. I want you to stand with me all over this place. So I was preparing. Thank you, Joey. And a song that I have not thought about for years came into my mind, an old hymn. And it says, there's room at the cross for you. I know there's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. And I came here today to tell you that there's room at the cross for one more. And that one more is you. And so sometimes I do things one way, sometimes I do another, and I don't know why, but I just really feel like today is one of those altar calls where I'm going to say, if you need Jesus, I'm asking you to humble yourself and step out and come down that aisle and come down here, and we have good folks that will help you pray. We got pastors, Pastor T, we got people ready right now. They will help you and help you say what, what to say and to pray and to give your life to Jesus. And so, Lord, I pray right now that if anybody in this house needs to get saved, anybody needs to give their life to you, and you're dealing with them, this whole message, they're almost ready to run to the altar. I pray, God, you'll help them right now to overcome stubbornness and fear and embarrassment and pride and anything else. And the devil's whispering in their ear, don't you do it, don't do it, don't do it. Help them, God, to overcome that and to come to this altar today and give their life to you and be gloriously saved and their sins washed away so they can be part of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. Come on, I'm going to sing.